joining us for good morning. Yeah, that's no problem. Oh, he's here. <laughs> that was a sh short term promotion. <laughs> Kia ora tātou. Um, good morning everybody. Welcome to the Strategy and Operations Committee meeting for Thursday the 20th um, of August. We've got the skeleton crew on today as we're observing um, social distancing. Um, James Jefferson, good to see you there. I hope you're not too much under the pump with um, going back into different levels. Um, fingers crossed. Very good. I'm just going to move through to the Council Blessing. Ia mato e fiti ana e nataki ke mua ia mato aro aro e pono ana mato ka kahatono ke te fakapau ma hara huapai mo na hapuri e mahi na mato me kaha hoki mato ka taua kia fai hua kia to tika ta mato mahi a mate mai te tiro fakamua me te hiri hiri ka ta tia ara i roto e te ko tahi tanga. Me te aroha. Item number three on the agenda is apologies, and I have apologies from Marilyn Stevens from the Ōtaki Community Board, Councillor Rob McCann, who's at another uh, council engagement, and Jackie Elliott for lateness. So if I could have someone move those apologies. Moved by Councillor Buswell, seconded by... Um, uh, Compton, Councillor Compton, thank you. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favour say aye. 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 Against, carried. I had Holborough in my head because Janet says so. <laughs> and I'm like, it's definitely not Councillor Holborough. <laughs> 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 Moving right along. Declarations of interest uh, relating to items on the agenda. I have not been made aware of any and I'm just having a quick look around the room. None that I can see. And so we move on to item number five, public speaking time. And again, I haven't been made of anyone coming in for public speaking. Just checking with Tanika. No? Wow, cracking into it. So item number six, members' business. There's no responses to public speaking. Any leave of absence? No one wanting a holiday? Matters of an urgent nature, none have been made aware to me. And so we move on to item number seven, updates, which there is none. And so we are now on to item number eight, reports, and Mark is joining us at the table. Good morning, Mark. And as you come up, I just want to say what a great job Mark and the team have done over the last three days with the financial presentations. I, I um, heard some uh, thanks from Councillor Halliday there in terms of the um, breadth and depth of the presentations. I was watching eagerly at home, as you are aware, on um, the live, uh, live stream and I think it's a great resource that we're now going to have available on the Council website. So um, thanks to you and the team, Mark. It's fantastic. You're very welcome. Thank you very much, um, Mr Chair. Good morning, everybody. Um, just in terms of the report, the finance update, I will take it as read, um, but I will just highlight a couple of points. There are two new sections to the report. Um, the first section is um, towards the back of the report, which details our um, COVID-19 costs to date, uh, specifically the um, community support package, as well as um, the staff costs in terms of uh, working at the EIC on the community needs assessment. So um, we did, we certainly did commit to um, provide regular updates on how our costs are tracking to date. So that's a new section, um, and then. The very last part of the report is, um, again, it's a new section. We used to do a separate paper, but it made more sense to just include it in this. This is uh, effectively seeking the committee's approval to write off um, just over $12,000 of bad debts. The, um, the chief executive has um, delegated financial authority to write off bad debts up to a value of $1,000. Anything over $1,000 um, does need to come before the committee for approval. Um, we as you can see, some of those are pretty long, uh, old, well, sorry, um, have been um, outstanding for um, some time. And um, what we try is we, we, we exhaust every single avenue. Um, so this does take time. So um, we, we can honestly say that we've done everything in our powers to try and, and reclaim that money. So we, we bring it um, to the table for, for consideration and approval when there's just nothing left to do. Um, 
The only other thing that I would, would highlight is um, if we refer to the statement of comprehensive revenue and expense, there are uh, two quite exceptional items. Um, we had $14 million of uh, assets vested to us relating to the first part of the expressway. Um, that's because the, um, those assets, the link roads related to the uh, M2PP, have now gone past the defects liability period. So we have taken ownership of that, so they're under our control. So that has come into, into our books. And we have also done, um, we have our um, auditors, Ernst & Young, are, um, are here. <laughs> they're with us for uh, two months. We are working through the annual report, uh, which um, is a basically an audit of our financial performance, uh, both uh, financial and non-financial performance, for the year ended 30th of June 2020, so they're here now. Um, and as part of that, we have to do um, uh, lots of uh, reviews of our assets. There's an impairment uh, for what's called the landfill aftercare asset. It's uh, an asset is something we own or control and derive economic benefit from. Um, as you've seen in the report, the uh, landfill is going to be, the capping of the landfill has um, progressed faster than what we anticipated. And as a result, we'll be closing the landfill four years earlier. Um, we still have two years to go and the um, the revenue that we'll derive from cleanfill over the next two years is very minimal. And in terms of accounting standards, where you're not going to be deriving economic benefit, you fill it, you effectively you write or impair the asset, so it's gone down to zero. So there's $3 million uh, hitting our uh, expenditure line. So if we actually took that um, assets that are vested are recognised as revenue, it's not really revenue, it's just, it's, again, it's an accounting standard. You, um, you recognise the, um, the fair value of the asset, but it goes above the line into revenue. If you actually take um, the vested asset revenue uh, off the books and um, you remove that uh, impairment or write-off of the landfill aftercare asset, then um, the sort of the, the normal um, position at the year end is that we were $2.2 .2 million favourable to budget. Um, reasons for that are in the report, so I'm very happy to go to questions, Mr Chair. Thank you, Mark. Um, any questions? So we're talking about 8.1 in the paper. Councillor Halliday. Oh, just, I've got a couple of questions, but quickly, just in the regards to the vested um, assets that come in from roading, etc., um, I'm just curious to know why that is counted as revenue and not just slipped straight into the asset uh, portfolio as such, not counted there. Yeah, it's just um, it's just one of those complexities of our accounting standards. So when we take it on the book, we take it as fair value. We account for it for reven as revenue, and then it is reflected on the balance sheet as well. So it's just one of those accounting standards. It's one of those complex accounting treatments. Uh, there, there are a couple. Um, for example, our fair valuation of our financial derivatives. It's one of those. Could I could I just add to that on the, on the same because it's on the same topic, Mark? It could be seen as like a real win for council, forty million dollars worth of assets slash revenue, but with that comes liabilities. So if you can just maybe talk to that a little bit. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. So so yes, um, or, you know it does. Um, we well, so I've um, just highlighted if we remove it, how we performed. Um, it's it's accounted for revenue, but it's not really revenue. Um, those assets are transferred to the council, so the. Uh, the rewards and liabilities transfer with that ownership. Those assets do go onto our balance sheet and we then start to depreciate those assets. So we take on the uh, liability of maintaining and looking after those assets and um, then mm -hmm. actually need to start um, uh, recognising the cost of those assets over their useful life, which flows into depreciation, which then uh, has an impact on rates uh, in following years. Councillor Halliday, your second one. Um, yeah, um, num page 8, number 11. Um, oh look, I actually just wanted to compliment the uh, roading team for ensuring that we have such a um, good take-up on subsidies from uh, funding from NZTA. It's a fairly substantial figure, um, which obviously um, is, um, yeah, is a great win for us. Um, just wanted to note that, that was all. Um, in number 13, page 9, um, and it comes back to what you're just talking about about the vested um, roading again. I just wanted to clarify something. When you talk about um, um, there's a defects period, uh, uh, just clarity from my side. Is this where the um, we ensure that we're getting a good quality asset coming back to us before we start taking the maintenance aspect of that on? Is that right? Through you, Mr. Chair. Yes, in a nutshell, that's exactly right. So there's a defects liability period. Um, those assets are new. 
uh, embedded into the contract. If anything goes wrong with those assets over that defects liability period, the uh, onus or the obligation is not on the council, but is on the contractors to fix it so that when we take over those assets, they've effectively been commissioned and we've got assurance that we're taking on an mm -hmm. asset that um, can be put into use uh, as intended. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, number 15.3 on page 10. Martin, if I could just clarify further on that last point, partly because it's my portfolio and I'm happy to be corrected, but I'm pretty sure that um, Council's team inspect that asset prior to receiving it and they'll raise any concerns around, say, the surface of the road um, and then if it, is, if it needs um, uh, repair or replacement, that's done prior to handover and then there's the defect period as well. So there's quite a rigorous process there. We don't just get given it. Um, it yeah, there is a process that goes through in terms of the handover as well. Um, see, number 13, just, uh, sorry, uh, no, sorry, number 15.3 on page 10. Um, I'm curious, with regards to annual leave allowance, um, as part of our training, we're told that we're using a accrual based accounting system. Um, is, um, is this allowance just allowed for when it's incurred rather than when it's taken? And is that debt an accumulating in, a, in an account somewhere, or do we borrow to pay that when it comes up, sort of thing? Through you, Mr. Chair, I was expecting this uh, this question to come up. So, um, <clears throat> so yes, we do prepare our financial statements and indeed our quarterly reports on an accrual basis. So, um, in terms of accounting, um, so uh, in terms of our expenditure, we recognise our expenditure when it's incurred, not necessarily when the invoice is paid. Now, when it comes to staff's annual leave. Um, we recognise we recognise annual leave as it's incurred, not when it's simply paid out. So in terms of our in terms of our budgeting, um, what we do, our budget assumption is we don't budget for annual leave. The assumption is that staff are entitled to a certain amount of annual leave per year and they take that full allowance. But in terms of the accounting entries, every month you recognise the, the cost because annual leave is effectively a cost uh, to the employer. So month on month, at the end of uh, each quarter, we recognise so if staff haven't, you know, staff embedded in their employment contracts are entitled to a certain amount of leave, that comes with a cost. So the accounting entry is to recognise the cost of that annual leave. So what it, uh, in terms of the accounting entry, is it's recognised an as an expense on the profit and loss and it's a liability on the balance sheet because if staff don't take that leave we're still obligated to, they, they're still entitled to take that leave and we need to, um, when they are on annual leave, we have to pay that cost. So as I said, we don't typically budget for, uh, for annual leave because we, um, we, our assumption is that staff will take their full annual leave entitlement. So throughout what happens during the month is you'll be recognising the expense within your salary costs and you have your liability. When staff take the leave, we're obviously making those payments so our liability is coming down, so we reduce the liability on the balance sheet and it's recognised as a credit on our expense line. Now, with COVID-19, no one's taken annual leave. So what's been happening is there's been, we've been recognising the expenditure on the P&L, people haven't been taking annual leave, so that credit, that liability on the balance sheet hasn't come down and hasn't offset our personnel costs. So. Um, it's a rare position to be in, but because of COVID-19, because of lockdown, because people can't really go anywhere, our staff aren't really taking annual leave, and um, that, as a result, it's increased our personnel costs. Martin, I've got a follow-up on that. Did you have anything else to add to that, that particular question? So, Mark, I had um, the same one highlighted, but for different reasons. Totally understand the liability. A business, you've got to understand you could have $50,000 in um, outstanding leave. That's a liability for the business. It could be you know, called up at... Um, at any point. Um, the, my concern is around the ability for the organisation to be able to give staff leave in a shortened period. So um, you can carry over, I'm just trying to think in terms of, um, in terms of the leave button, and I, I might be wrong on that, but, but the concern is you might only have, say, six months left in your year and staff haven't have leave and you've got this big bow wave of leave that's been accrued. Is that a concern in terms of being able to get people away, keep business as usual going? You know, we've heard that we've got a lot coming up over the next few months. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. So there's really two parts to that. Uh, there's, there's two aspects that I'll reply to. So, um, 
Yes, there's, there's the financial obligation on the council to um, make good uh, annual leave payments. So um, when staff are not taking leave, it's effectively increasing the cost of our liability. So we do um, constantly, each month, we, um, we look at the annual leave reports from our staff and we identify those that are, um, we have a policy that um, you can't, you know, um, you, you don't, it doesn't expire. You don't just simply lose your annual leave. It's not after two years, if you use it or lose it, we don't have that. But we do, um, we do have a policy where you can't continue, uh, you can't just accumulate leave on leave on leave on leave. Um, but underlying that, our main concern is staff that aren't taking leave are, are, you know, are just working way too hard. So it's a wellness, uh, it's a well-being, health and well-being issue. So yes, there's the financial um, uh, liability on the council, but our, our deeper concern is that staff do need to take leave, they do need to refresh. Um, so with, um, with those two elements, we do review our annual leave entitlement uh, liability every month. And for those staff that do have um, high leave balances, um, our managers work with them and um, put in place a leave plan. And from time to time, um, what we do see typically is um, staff will uh, be accumulating uh, annual leave deliberately, for example, in overseas trips. So, um, but yes, we do, we do focus on that very heavily and uh, we do certainly want to make sure that our staff are taking breaks in terms of high workload. Um, we just have to manage that with resources. So as you can see, we've commented on that we've had to take on additional resources. Okay. Uh, I m think it might just be important for me to clarify my concern was around the wellness and in terms of their ability to be able to take on leave given the demands on the organisation. My secondary and, and less concern was around the ability for the organisation to do BAU given the tension around the pressure on allowing staff to have a leave. And from what I can um, tell from your responses that you take, we will take on additional resources to allow them to take leave and still cover BAU. Through you, Mr. Chair, absolutely. And just just the last point um, is that during our audits, our auditors um, take a very keen interest on in, in our annual leave um, balances. Uh, as um, for them, a, a trigger is where if you start to see a staff member or a series of staff members that are constantly not taking leave, um, that is one of the indicators, or, or what I, sh I shouldn't say indicator, I should say it's one of the flags of um, potential fraud. So, um, so with the wellbeing, the liability and the auditors, we're looking at that all the time. Yep. Um, Councillor Holborough. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <coughs> and this report, I have to say, made for easier reading having attended all three of the sessions this week. <laughs> so thank you very much for those. Um, I'm just asking about the, uh, on page um, 19 uh, in the table, the, the carryover table, the um, self-insurance fund carryover. Um, the 0% risk factor. Am I on the right page? Zero percent risk factor. Maybe it's page twenty. What is a zero percent risk factor, and how do you have a zero percent risk factor when you have a global pandemic? It just seems kind of counterintuitive. And why didn't we access some of those funds rather than stopping paying down our depreciation when we're in ex extraneous circumstances? <laughs> Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, Thank you, yes. Um, you are pointing to page 19, um, the table which looks at capex carryovers, the self-insurance the self fund. So, um, so every single year in terms of um, self-insurance fund, we, we rate fund for $150,000 of OPEX and, and, and we make a budget provision for $250,000 of capex. Now this is for um, effectively loss events whereby um, we can't claim on our insurance policy because we're below the, the excess. So um, because it's a capex fund, effect effectively uh, perhaps, perhaps we could have worded it a little bit different. Effectively what we're saying is we haven't had to call on the um, capex self-insurance fund for uninsured losses. Um, so typically if we have a loss event, um, so whatever it is, if we have flooding, it may be um, it may be the, it may be simply be repairs and maintenance. Um, that's opex in nature, depending on the uh, on the amount. If it's under a million dollars, if it's on our um, underground infrastructure, if it's under a million dollars, we bear the brunt of it. We may be um, effectively replacing a whole asset again if it's under a million dollars. Um, 
we, um, we just have to uh, fund that through borrowing. So we make for the budget provision so that we are ready to be able to meet the costs of uh, uninsured loss events. We do roll it over and, and in fact it is something that we will be looking at. Um, at you know, do we just allow the, the CapEx fund to continually build up or do we repurpose that budget for something else, for example? So, um, so the 0%, the, the narrative there is simply saying that we haven't had a, a, a loss event, an uninsured loss event, that we've had to use that fund to replace an asset. Yes, thanks for that clarification. It seems like it's aimed at physical events rather than the kind of events that we've had and maybe it's time to, to rethink how we protect ourselves for this kind of event. And it could be, sorry I'm making a comment here, <laughs> maybe it could be the insurance in general could be the subject of a further public workshop <laughs> or a part of one. Um, a further question if I might, Mr Chair? So um, I'm just, it might be for further in the, um, in the agenda when we talk about um, our water infrastructure. But I'm just looking at um, the Water Professional Services Panel, and it's probably been in reports before, but it's kind of stuck out to me now because we're looking at a water regulator coming in, and I'm just wondering what the interaction is between those two things. So I could flag it for later when we're talking about water management, but I just noticed that word in here in this table, so maybe we'll... I don't know how to deal with that question. Um. So, you know, it would be nice to have him in the room to speak a bit more to, to that. But basically, um, the procurement around these significant um, water projects, they have used a professional services panel. So they undertook a procurement process to bring on board a panel to help with a multi-year project. So that's all that's referring to, is that um, uh, they wanted to establish this panel of external um, consultants and advisors to help them with the work. Um, because obviously that's significant projects, you know, one's 12 million, one's 6 million, I think. So uh, it's generally accepted as good practice in terms of the way to go forward. So not entirely related to what will be going on with the Three Waters um, review, but Sean can talk more to that uh, later if you'd like. And uh, any of those items flagged, they're not items that are flagged to be in the running for expenditure through the government grant that's coming up through the water review? Broadly, yes. Um, the, 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 the government has said, um, can, you, can you use the, the grant that we're proposing to give you if you sign up? Um, we would prefer you use it um, as the shovel-ready project response. This is the only money you're getting um, towards those applications you may have put in. We prefer that you use it on water and wastewater as a first priority before stormwater. But um, the, that within those parameters, they're reasonably um, open, reasonably light touch monitoring and criteria setting. So um, we've taken the approach that whilst we might, um, we might brief you on the exact mix of how, how we will spend all of our money. The key thing is to put that grant towards these significant water projects. That's our starting position as we'll do that. Um, it's a multi-year project, so we'll just look at what needs to be spent over the next 12 to 15 months. Thank you. Councillor Halliday. Uh, thank you through you, Mr Chair. Um, in relation to number 20, uh, which is on um, page 12, uh, it's actually shown on number 86 on page 30. Um, just um, I wanted to know, you had two uh, firms or contractors engaged to contact the uh, co to uh, conduct the revaluations um, that were in relation to that. Um, is that due to legislative requirement or are we just using specialists uh, or, or are we using specialists rather than uh, having the ability to do that um, in-house? Is, any, any, is that fairly specialised sort of thing? So through you, through you Mr Chair, so um, in terms of our accounting policy we do revalue our assets. Um, so this council has a policy of revaluing those assets um, to their fair value. Um, they need to be done by independent registered valuers. Um, so that's what we don't, we don't do it in-house, uh, we do outsource it. Um, with uh, with revaluation is a completely different skill set, 
And in terms of what we revalued um, for the 30th of June 2020 year, we were doing our three waters infrastructure um, plus our land and buildings, including our land under road. So that's a, a sizeable piece of work. Um, and so we used two valuers for that, uh, again through a tendering process. Um, I also note, um, uh, shown on pages 18 and 19, uh, we've got lower capital spending and it's been carried over um, 2.8 million in year one and 8.7 million uh, for future years and after the training that we've just had. Uh, is, it my, um, is it my understanding that um, that'll mean that there's less borrowings in this year uh, and those borrowing profile will be moved further down, further down with those? Is that how that works? Through you, Mr Chair, that's correct. Number 25, um, on page 15, um, I just wanted to note the uh, early payment of the bills. Um, it's quite a substantial amount of money to be getting into the local economy in a very short period of time, so I just wanted to commend uh, the Council on taking that initiative with regards to COVID response. Um, I'm hoping that a lot of that money went to local, uh, local providers as well in relation to our policy around trying to use local as much as we can. Um, the only other thing I had was um, on F, page 44, sorry, page 19, number 44, um, you've got community facilities and community support. Uh, you've got the project being district-wide access control system. Um, I'm sort of up to speed with everything else, but I hadn't heard of that one before. I was just wondering if, there could be, if I could get an explanation on what that is or if it's a project coming forward or is this not the uh, appropriate place to ask that? Could you just clarify, um, Councillor Hillard, I'm on page 19. Uh, third one down. Third one. Uh, second column in. District access control. Okay, so yep. Three of resources. Chair, um, those are the control systems for these buildings. So for your access card, for example, they're um, <laughs> well overdue for an upgrade uh, and to get to better practice. So. Just roading being picked up in economic development, um, and I think we mentioned this a while back as well, it seems an unusual place for that to sit um, rather than roading being picked up sort of as, as an expense somewhere else, especially since we're um, uh, going to be introducing the economic development strategy, we're going to need to be sort of a lot clearer perhaps on what the funding is in relation to economic development. So. Um Essentially, we agree. Um, uh, you'll see in the LTP, a I think, Mark, a proposal to shift the... It's basically town centres related spend um, largely in the roading. So, for example, what's going on out there uh, on the old state highway uh, revocation work, I think, is related. But uh, we've always seen that as a part of the economic development um, in the district, and hence, after much debate originally, it was in there for the last few years. But we, we, we've sort of come to the same conclusion that actually we should shift it back out. Whilst it does have an economic development um, consideration, it confuses the be what's it's out of everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Now that's it for my questions. Thank you very much. And if you think of the library as an example, it's not under ED, but we know from when the Waikanae Library closed it created an economic impact, so it is a bit of a tricky one. Did you want to add to that, Mark? Yeah, um, through you, Mr Chair. Yes, I just wanted to echo what the Chief Executive just said. As part of the long-term plan, and we're looking, we are working through those anomalies so that um, things actually sit where people would expect them to sit. Councillor Elliott, I see that your light was up earlier, but it's gone now. Did you have a question? For the briefing, however, I'm just, I'll, I'll signal it now so that Sean, if he watches, is prepared. But I'm curious to know, with the Three Waters Review, how the government proposes handling actual ownership transfers of all of the water assets, if that's going to happen, given that they're already security for the LGFA bonds and also the, the financials of the whole council. Thanks, Sorry. Councillor Elliott. And I think we do have a Three Waters briefing coming up at, yeah. whether it's, I can't if it's this afternoon or next week, so that's probably a question for them. It is, um, although we won't be able to give you those answers yet, because um, because that is the point of the next 12 months worth of work, is is to answer all of those questions. Mm -hmm. Yep, so, <laughs> big questions. 
I think at this stage what the chief executive is saying is even the powers that be don't know. <laughs> so, right, moving right along, I don't see any other questions in relation to this uh, 8.1 in the report, so if there isn't any, if we could have someone move the recommendations on page 49. It is 44 and 45. Move by His Worship the Mayor, seconded by Councillor Buswell. Any further discussion? All those in favour say aye. Aye. Against. Carried. Thank you, Mark. Are you still here? Are you moving? Uh, Contracts under delegated authority. No, I'm not, but I can be because Sean's not in the room. So <laughs> you go for it. So item 8.2, page 36, team. Um, contracts under delegated authority, and I'm just going to hand it back over to Mark. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll just take the report as read. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you would say that. Please don't ask any questions. Appendices attached to the report, team. If there are any questions, let's quick scan around the room. Nothing on the display, and so we have a recommendation on page 37, recommendation 8, that the one contract is accepted. Moved by Councillor Holborough, seconded by Councillor Hanford. Any further discussion? No? All those in favour say aye. Aye. Against. That is carried. Now, are you, you're finished. Thank you, Mark. Five minute break. Yeah, sure. So look, team, we just need to take a five minute break while staff load up a presentation for the next agenda item, if I've got that right, Tanika? Yep, so if you want to grab yourself a coffee, toilet stop, and back in the chambers at 10 past 10.